Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Devin Gala's Projects Coordinator. We have a great webinar for you today from Klaus Fleischmann of Kaleidoscope Communications on the four-hour terminology workflow. Uh, we're so pleased you could join us. Um, I'm going to hand it out over to Klaus in just one moment. But first, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. We've muted everyone's lines to cut down on any background noise. So if you experience any dif difficulties, uh, you can let me know using your chat box, and I'll work with you to troubleshoot them. If you have a slow internet connection, your audio may be disrupted. If that happens, you can use the number listed on the GoToWebinar panel to call in using your own phone. We are making a recording of this presentation, and you will be able to find it following the presentation on Gala On Demand, our training resource platform. Klaus will be answering your questions at the end of the presentation, uh, but you should feel free to type them into your chat box throughout the webinar to get into the queue. We'll get to as many questions as we can with the time remaining at the end of the session. Uh, so now, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Klaus for the remainder of the session. Klaus, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me fine? Great. Yeah, you sound great. All right. So I'll, I'll get rolling. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, talking to you from uh, beautiful Vienna, Austria, doing a little bit of commercial for my uh, country as well, who, which is living strongly off tourism. So uh, here we are in Vienna. And I'm going to talk today about the four-hour terminology work week, uh, which of course is a little bit of a take on the four-hour work week, um, which probably some of you know. If not, there's going to be a little bit more inside the presentation um, about what this is. Primarily, it's about uh, simplification. Um, so the subtitle that we chose for this presentation is uh, simplify your terminology life. So what is this uh, going to be um, all about? First of all, very brief uh, presentation of who we actually are, who Kaleidoscope is. Um, then uh, talk about a little bit why uh, we are talking about terminology at all. If uh, you know terminology um, has a reason for existing and whether it's worth it uh, in the bottom line. Um, then I'm going to go a little bit into processes, workflows, um, and then uh, my favorite topics, collaboration, um, engagement, engaging users and then maybe uh, hopefully a conclusion at the end uh, and I do intend of also showing you a little bit of software uh, so hopefully I'll get through the PowerPoints quickly enough but not too quickly um, I keep being reminded after pretty much every webinar that I tend to talk too fast um, so if I do that please uh, somehow interrupt me I don't know Devin you can probably do that um, and then I'll try to talk more slowly but English being uh, not my native language should already a little bit better than German. So um, let's start by uh, talking who we are about. Kaleidoscope uh, is actually a company that um, I personally founded in uh, 1996 after returning home from five years in Monterey, California, uh, which some of you might also know who are from this industry. Uh, and now we're based in Vienna, Austria, and we are essentially a company that uh, sells technology and services um, to help internationally active companies um, produce and manage um, global product information. Uh, we essentially have uh, two things that we do here. On the one hand side, we uh, sell, resell services uh, and technology by some of our um, technology partners. Um, first and foremost, actually, SDL, which I guess some of you have also heard of, um, but also some other software products. Um, and we also develop our own software. Um, and on this end, first and foremost, we are the developers of QuickTerm. Um, which is a little bit what this presentation is about. At least QuickTerm tries to implement the ideas that we are bringing forward in this presentation. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say about um, Kaleidoscope. Uh, if you want to know more, then drop me an email or send me a tweet. I have my contacts at the end of the presentation. Uh, so why are we actually talking about terminology? Uh, do we need that at all? Uh, does it make sense to manage terminology? Um, what are the issues when uh, we write uh, product information when we try to communicate, let's say, technical content, but actually any content at all um, to other people. Um, the first thing is uh, we want to communicate uh, in a clear way. Uh, so I once stumbled across this thing here, which is a heat-treated aluminum hand bender. Um, and I was strongly wondering whether you actually bend aluminum hands with that and what an aluminum hand actually is um, and why hands are heat-treated or how this all ha goes together. Um, very complicated for a German-speaking person to understand an English construct like this. Um, so I was thinking about aluminum hands. And um, actually, you can buy these things. So if you go to Amazon, um, you can actually buy a heat-treated aluminum hand bender. Um, so this is not very clear from a terminological um, point of view what we are actually talking about there. And I have beautiful German words that 
are even a lot less clear than that. Um, we also want to be precise. Uh, so here I once found an interesting warning label, which for all of you who are into very technical uh, and dangerous products, you pr probably know um, about warning labels and you know the kind of uh, requirements those have in terms of precision. Um, and I don't know if you recognize what kind of a product uh, is being or, or this is being applied to. Uh, and it's actually a candlestick. Um, but it's very confusing. It's not very precise. And interestingly, in a lot of uh, industries, the symbol they use on here for a candlestick um, is actually standardized, and it's an explosive charge. So that alone is just not very precise. So uh, you know, while it's good to communicate in images, they sometimes are not precise enough. So we actually need to write down things, and we need to define things. And that's when we are in terminology. Uh, and the third thing, we always will try uh, or want to be unambiguous. Of course, not only if you want your text to be translated, then it makes sense to be unambiguous, particularly if you go into things like machine translation, but also if you just want your readers to understand what you're talking about, you want to be unambiguous. So there's two aspects to this. Uh, one is synonymity. Uh, synonymity meaning actually the same thing. So this is um, a feature of a software uh, where you can just hit like a shortcut on your keyboard and then directly access a certain command. Um, and this has numerous synonyms. So it's a keyboard shortcut, it's an access key, it's a hot key, um, all those things. And that's not very unambiguous because you might wonder, well, is that all the same? Is there a difference maybe between these individual features? Um, or are they really being used as synonyms? And the opposite of that, of course, is homonymity. So homonyms um, essentially mean we have the same written word but it actually means different things. And interestingly, um, if we look at these three concepts we have down here, yeah, uh, in German, they're all written the same way. Yeah? So in German, for all of those who happen to speak German, all of these are called Welle, uh, whereas, of course, in English, that doesn't work. So you would not call this a wave. That Nobody would understand that. You would not call this a shaft. Uh, and the problem, of course, is that this is different in every language that you go into, or very often. It's sometimes, for some strange reason, you have similar homonyms. Um, so, for instance, in English, uh, this is both a wave. Yeah? So this is a, I don't know, electrical or magnetic or whatever wave. Uh, and this is an ocean wave. Uh, if you go into other languages, for instance, Spanish, then you find out that this is actually ola and onda. Um, so again, here, you don't have homonyms in Spanish where you have them in English. And in German, it's different again. So this is very confusing. It's unclear. It's unprecise. It's, um, it's, it's ambiguous. So that's why we need um, terminology management to make the whole thing a little bit clearer. So if you have decided, and this was just a very brief way of trying to convince you, which I assume all of you are convinced anyhow, um, what do you need to start uh, managing your terminology? Um, well, I personally think um, you need to differentiate uh, two things and then four things. Two things is you need to differentiate. Uh, there's a certain set of things you need if you want to start a terminology project. Uh, and then if you want to keep a process running or a system running, there's a different set of things you need. But some of the things you need to think about is what are actually the goals um, of doing terminology. For instance, what's my target target audience? So it's very, very different if you want to manage terminology just for translators, you know, quote unquote, just for translators, or if you want to make this available throughout your company or maybe even publicly or um, something like that, then you just have to write, for instance, definitions completely differently depending on your target audience. And you will most likely also include different kinds of terms and concepts uh, in your terminology depending on who's going to use it. Also, the type of terminology management is something you need to think about. You need to obviously develop a plan. You need to uh, you know, get decision makers on board. You have to get uh, approvals, sponsors. You need to set milestones, etc. You will need technology. And when it comes to technology, you need to think about some software, obviously, that you need to use. Um, but more than that, you need to think about what kind of data models, what concept systems do I want? Do I want to go into ontology at all? Um, do I want to have workflow in the system, um, et cetera? And of course, you will need money. So terminology costs money. Um, and that's when we come to the question of, is there a return on investment of terminology? And again, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I actually did a webinar for uh, Scott Abel in the fall. I can't remember when. Um, that was exclusively on return on investment. So if you're more interested in that topic, uh, maybe look that up. It's probably still online. Um, but essentially, if you're talking about a return on investment, you have to find out uh, the benefits, and you have to divide them through the cost. Uh, and if this um, division 
um, gives you a positive number, then the whole thing had a return on investment. So essentially, if you have more benefits than costs, then it was a good thing to do. Um, right. So what would be the benefits? Um, and since I most likely have a little bit of a split audience, some of you are probably on the selling side, as Common Sense Advisory would put it. So you're probably a translation service providers. Um, of course, there are different benefits to doing um, terminology management than if you're on the buyer side, meaning if you're a company. Um, so let's look at the um, service providers first. So the benefits would be, of course, customer retention. You can lock in your clients fairly light, nicely if you have a, a thorough grip on the terminology. Um, it's very interesting. Almost every customer we talk to has just the most com complicated subject matter uh, you can possibly imagine. And knowing our terminology is really very difficult. Um, at least I find that every customer tends to think that about themselves uh, when really if you have a good terminology uh, in place, it becomes not that complex after all. You will have uh, higher quality in terms of consistency. Um, and consistency is not only within one language, but particularly also across the languages. That if you have a project that goes into, say, 26 languages, European languages, um, you, will be, you will be asked certain questions about the terminology by certain translators of certain languages which really should be asked by pretty much any translator because otherwise it's not intelligible, the text is not intelligible. Um, and that's not the case. So by managing terminology centrally for all languages, you can make sure that the issues that are raised in one language um, actually trickle down to the other languages as well. Um, and talking about translator queries, by the way, we have a magnificent, magnificent tool for managing translator queries if you're interested in that. Um, we have found that uh, the vast majority of queries are actually terminological queries. Uh, so it makes sense to link this query management into um, that as well um, and make sure that you know if a translator asks a question about terminology, put it in your term base, then no other translator will ask that question again, hopefully. So research it once uh, and then use it a lot. Um, and one important benefit for the uh, LSPs, I think, is that you have a good documentation. So you need to know who actually approved the terminology because if in one point you will get, I don't know, a feedback from a client about some terminolo terminological misuse or something like that, uh, you need to be able to document to them, oh no, but your reviewer XYZ has approved this on this and that date, uh, and that's why we're using it. So that's also very important because I think what a client might notice very often in um, even languages that they don't speak um, is a terminological issue. So for instance, if you translate the word user manual on the title page, differently every time you translate into Turkish, very likely your client is going to catch that. Probably not a big you know, security problem, um, but the client will notice that. On the other hand, if you're a buyer, so if you're on the client side, uh, then there are some uh, interesting ways of trying to find out benefits. Uh, of course, the ideal benefit would be you actually sell more. That's a little bit hard to verify, um, although I do think that terminology plays a role in that um, because you have better quality information. Search engine optimization is something that has very directly to do with terminology. Um, but as I said, it's a bit hard to actually verify that. Um, on the other hand, higher efficiency, so that means reduced cost, which you know is also kind of a benefit if you reduce your costs. Um, so you will be able to I don't know, speed up translation, reduce lookup times, reduce queries, reduce research time. Uh, and that you can actually calculate with a clear methodology. And um, I talked about that a little bit in Scott Abel's uh, webinar. Um, I hope Gala is friends with him, otherwise I'm getting into trouble here. Um, another uh, benefit would be avoided external costs. Yeah, uh, So this is true particularly for some very strongly regulated industries um, or patents, things like that, where you get into terminological issues. Um, and then, of course, also internal avoided costs, just misunderstandings between colleagues of two different divisions that are discussing something, and then they figure out they're actually talking about the same thing all these times anyhow. Um, so those are some of the benefits, um, but of course you also need to talk about costs. So you do have management costs, of course, you know, you need to manage this, you need to constantly market your, your term base. Um, you have content costs, meaning generating the terminology content uh, is simply costly. Um, depending on the amount of languages, of course, you also have costs in bringing this into other languages. Um, and then you also obviously have usage costs. So if you go to the term base and look something up, that takes a while. Um, so that also costs something. You need to be fair and um, also consider that. But when we look at the cost side, I always think, um, I think every company and every LSP has these costs anyhow. Yeah? So whenever you stumble across a term that you don't understand, 
you actually need to do terminology research. Um, and I personally think um, the most costly kind of terminology management is actually not to manage terminology at all. So that means every time somebody stumbles across that not intelligible term, they need to research it again and again and again. And the colleague next week will have to research it again. Whereas if you manage it, um, you don't have to research it twice. You just do it once. So essentially what we're doing is we're adding the benefit. Um, and of course, we are classifying the cost. That's often a problem. As soon as you start the terminology project, there is actually a cost center called terminology. Uh, and you actually incur costs, which of course before that was just a hidden cost. So talking about costs, the question is, how can we do efficient? terminology management, and that's where the four-hour terminology uh, work weeks uh, comes in. So for everybody who doesn't know Tim Ferriss, I recommend looking uh, that up, the fourhourworkweeks.com. It's a very interesting book to read, um, but also he has a very interesting blog and a podcast, so it's um, pretty amazing, actually, the kind of information you can find there. So I do highly recommend it, and um, I kind of stole the title from him a little bit, but since I'm doing some commercials, I guess that's okay for him. Um, so when we simplify, we need to look at uh, processes and workflows that we can actually simplify. So if you look at terminology processes in organizations, LSPs, uh, there are typically two competing ways of dealing with that. Uh, one is an organic approach. That means you know that there are several initiatives in the company. You just let them coexist and not worry about it. Or there is what um, Ronan Martin actually from the SAS Institute calls the grand approach, which actually means that you uh, deliberately manage the process, and of course, the kind of terminology process I'm talking about is this um, grand approach. If you go into companies and look at these grand approach terminology processes, what I often find is that um, a lot of these terminology processes or projects um, turn out to be a dead end street. What, what do I mean with that? I mean that somebody starts an Excel list, uh, eventually, they get moved into a different division. That Excel list simply dies somewhere uh, in a file server. Uh, where if very frequently there's actually more than just one dead end street. Uh, I think that's in Denmark, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, the other thing I find very often is that terminology is dealt with uh, like a one-way street. So that means there is somebody that dictates terminology that just says, this is what we use, period. And nobody has any word in that. So you just take and use it, or you have no way of actually voicing your concern with that or something like that. There's also the wiki approach which means it's kind of like very democratic, almost anarchy, that anybody can contribute, anybody can create terms about whatever they want to. Um, and then there is the extreme, which is the terminator, a terminologist the terminator, um, who just decides, no, this is what we're going to say, uh, period. Um, and uh, I decide, and nobody has uh, the right to tell me what I, what I can do as a terminologist. Um, and I personally think that all of these uh, approaches uh, will probably not work in the long time. Um, because I think what you need is actually you need a process, not simply a project or not simply a list, but you need a real process um, and ideally a collaborative uh, process, so get users involved. Um, if you talk about processes, there's um, a lot you could say about that. I'm going to be very quick. Uh, essentially, uh, you typically have three stages in a terminology process. So you have uh, some requesting phase, um, which means that somebody needs a new term either because they just invented a new feature or because as a translator you stumbled across a new term that you don't understand or um, you want to make sure you use it consistently the next time you come across it. Um, so there's this phase where you say, I need something. Um, then there is this research and recommendation uh, phase, which essentially means I'm gathering input for this. I'm ideally writing a definition. It's not always necessary. Um, I'm maybe categorizing it into subject fields. Maybe I'm adding an image or something like that. Um, and then there should be an approval. So of course, in a good terminology workflow, in a good process, there is some approval step in the end. So you ask people outside your own department or just outside yourself, actually, um, whether they agree that that is correct. Um, and that's also an interesting um, phase in the process. So typically, these are the steps. Typically, this is what um, the workflows look like. Um, and I'll go over that. But of course, the question is, I was talking about a four-hour uh, terminology work week. Um, so is that realistic to do in four hours a week if you're the only terminologist the company has? Bart would say, no way, man. I hope I pronounced that more or less correctly. Um, so this is where we get into the notion and the idea of collaboration. So what do I mean with collaboration? Uh, with collaboration, I actually mean 
distributing your effort. So there shouldn't be one terminator that is the only one that works on terminology, poor guy. Um, but we're trying to spread this out to as many users as possible. Um, this, of course, lowers the effort by each one individual user. So it just has it's just a lot more work power, obviously, behind it. Um, I think it also means higher quality. That, that goes a little bit into the, the Wikipedia um, approach where you say, well, the more brains are thinking about that, the, the better the outcome is going to be. Or you have some user that is just a total specialist on a particular subject matter. Um, they can provide valuable feedback. Um, so we think let's try to get some sort of collaboration. Let's learn from you know what Web 2.0 has done, what Jeremy, Jeremy Rifkin talks about in um, all his Creative Commons things, which essentially means let's just work together voluntarily, maybe even in his ideal world voluntarily, maybe not quite so voluntarily in terminology, but let's just work together and share the product. So um, let's try to engage the user base. Um, and who are we talking about when we talk about the user base? So what, what I mean when I talk about the user base is, I mean, um, of course, our end clients. Uh, they're the ones that eventually or um, effectively create uh, the terminologies. Um, the subject matter experts, um, sorry, I know this also means small and medium enterprises, but I mean subject matter experts um, with this. Uh, we, of course, mean the LSP, the language service provider, uh, with all their project managers and quality assurance and whatever they have. Um, of course, the translators, um, and of course, the in-country reviewers, which are a very, very valuable resource in the whole terminology game. <clears throat> so what would be ideal is to get all these people involved in the terminology process. To do what? Uh, well, to start with, to gather input from as many people as possible. So if we look at the stakeholders that I have just managed, uh, mentioned, um, of course, we have these translators. Um, they, of course, use the existing terminology, but they also ask questions. They, they request new terms. They give feedback um, to existing ones, ideally integrated into their environment. So if they work with Trouble Studio, for instance, then they should write mouse click a term and say, oh, this should be requested. Um, subject matter experts, uh, of course, those are the ones that help us actually develop a concept. Yeah? So they will give us definitions. They will tell us uh, which terms, at least in their source language or source languages. M many companies have more than one source language nowadays. Um, they tell us, well, which terms are valid, which are synonyms that are actually not valid. They are the ones that might end up approving uh, an entry once it's there. Um, they work on their, I don't know, smartphone, web, wherever they want to, but not a very complicated uh, environment. Um, we have project manage, managers many many times on the LSP side, um, so they can be involved in this as well, moderating between all the other uh, stakeholders, making sure the information comes um, from one uh, team member and goes to the other one. Uh, and then last but absolutely not least, we have the reviewers, which answer translator questions, which confirm suggestions that the translators have or reject them, um, which give feedback and ideally should be integrated into whatever tool they use to do um, the review. Um, so this was the gathering input phase. If you remember, we had these three phases. So that's the requesting phase. Um, on the edit phase, we can also uh, think of systems where we can edit collaboratively. Uh, so we can delegate tasks around. If, you know, if I get the request to provide some info uh, onto a certain entry, but I just don't know that subject matter, I could delegate it on or ask um, a colleague of mine. Maybe we have some sort of a voting system behind it. You can ask, I don't know, 20 subject matter experts what they think about this definition, and then they can vote for um, or against it. Um, and yeah, and then of course we come to the approval phase, which is the last one. Um, the approvers are really important people, um, not only to the terminology process, but also to other processes in the company typically. So we have to try to make it really, really simple to them also, because they're very far away from terminology, so they don't know a lot about what terminology is, what these complicated tools are. So this has to be really, really simple maybe by allowing them just you know, approve or reject or vote for or vote against something. Um, and we might even think about some sort of motivation to them. So there are approaches where we say this was the top approver of the month or uh, things like that that go a little bit into community building. Um, and if we look at this from the four hours uh, that I have mentioned, um, so I just envisioned some scenario here where I said, OK, we will spread out four, hour, four hours. Um, into these four different stakeholders. So we have four translators, which have an hour each. We have a project manager with an hour each, four reviewers, four clients, subject matter experts. And if we assume that 
um, a translator files four new terms um, in an hour and maybe provides foreign language equivalents to um, four other terms, which the other three translators have uh, suggested. Um, we might have a client subject matter expert that provides input for these uh, four terms maybe. Um, four times four is 16 again. Uh, so then they have, if we divide this, they have 15 minutes for each input. I think that's uh, more than enough to tell us whether there are synonyms to this and whether this is allowed and maybe what the explanation of this um, term is. Uh, we have the project manager, who is, of course, the central moderator of the whole thing, of the whole collaboration system. Um, so they have to delegate these things around and potentially also do the final approval just to make sure that nobody missed a point and, you know, that data isn't, point is missing or the categories set to the wrong one or whatever. Uh, and then we have the reviewers, um, which will have to approve these 16 uh, new entries. So that means they have four, min four minutes per entry in this one hour um, to approve the entries. So I also think four minutes for one entry is absolutely realistic. Uh, so if we um, do the maths here, then in a year we will end up with 832 new entries, which is not a great lot. But of course, if you go more out into the crowd, and if you really try to spread this uh, through your entire user base, through all the translators, um, then of course the numbers start growing. This is exponential. So the more people you add, um, the, the larger this will grow. So if we have um, five times as many people, then we already have more than 4,000 new entries a year done with just four hours a week. Um, that's quite a bit. So 4,000 entries is almost a decent sized term base already. If you do this three, four years, you have a really nice term base. Um, so the question, of course, is uh, how do we get users to do this? Um, that's a good question. And we can look a little bit into uh, what the new web technologies are doing and what all these, you know, what Jeremy Rifkin also talks a lot about. Uh, we have a phenomenon like, you know, open source uh, platforms like Wikipedia, which is all done by volunteers. Well, almost all done by volunteers. Um, we have uh, things like Facebook, which gets crowdsourced. We have things like Translators Without Borders, where people voluntarily translate or donate software or money, um, or also Twitter. Um, and the question is, why do people do this for free? Um, and I think there's about five reasons why they do that. Uh, one is because it's a good cause. Of course, that's the Translators Without Borders issue. Um, another could be because it's a cool product. So that's probably the Facebook one. Yeah, the French people probably just wanted this cool application to be in French, so they just did it. Um, another one could be because you're part of a community, and that goes a little bit into crowdsourcing, maybe also into open source a little bit. Yeah? You build a name for yourself in a certain community. That's pretty good for a software developer because you will maybe eventually get hired um, out of that community. So that could be a reason to do it. Um, maybe also simply because it's fun. Um, and probably also simply because if I get some sort of a benefit out of this, if I can learn from it, for instance, uh, learn about terminology, why not? Um, then this could also be a motivator to actually engage into this. Um, so I think what we should do is uh, we should try people to participate by telling them, well, you know, terminology is a part of any good product. And if I'm an employee of a company that's proud of my products, terminology should be a part of that. Of course, everybody benefits uh, if we have uh, terminology. Um, and in order to engage people, it also has to be interesting and it also has to be fun. And I think if you look at a lot of terminology projects, uh, one thing that is uh, a common thread um, or a common denominator of all these uh, terminology projects is that there is somebody who is doing constant marketing um, for this good cause of terminology. Um, and you can do that by writing news articles, by writing blogs, by writing in the employer magazine, things like that. Um, but you could also do that in the term base itself by just providing really surprising goodies. Um, so for, for instance, what we have done in a lot of projects is um, our terminology teams can draw up term quizzes. So they will have like a monthly term quiz out there where employees can log in and test their knowledge about terminology, but also basically the entire company and the product or whatever you want to put into this terminology quiz or simply by having something like an entry of the week. A lot of people love this word of the week, business dictionary entry of the day, things like that. So why not have an entry of the week on our terminology site? So that might be one thing to do it. So here are two examples. Uh, this, the first one is the term base of the University of Vienna, uh, which has a term of the week out there. The second one is the um, term of the week that the Austrian National Bank um, puts out once a week so that people at the National Bank will log in there and, and learn something. Um, of course, this is always very um, trendy, uh, so something that just got founded or something that just changed in the structure that the 
European Central Bank system works or whatever. Um, and actually, I also have two screenshots of uh, some term quizzes um, that the Austrian National Bank um, put out there. Yeah, so they have some really, of course, central banky kind of things. Yeah, so this is borderline terminology or not exact. Particularly, if you say, okay, what what does a vapor do? Um, that has nothing to do really with central bank terminology anymore. It's just interesting, and that's the point. It's interesting to the people to learn this. Um, and we kind of lure them into the term base because, of course, on all these things, there could be a hyperlink that takes us straight into the term base, or you could just have an end result after this whole quiz um, that says, well, your weakness was here and there, so go to the term base, look at this subject matter field, for instance. Um, those are things we try to do in our software also, um, and we also design the whole software around this idea of being collaborative, so everybody can request things, participate, like things. We really try to make the terminology database not just something where you go to to look up a term because that you know honestly is just boring to go somewhere and look up a term. We try to really make it uh, a website, a forum where people log on, learn things, um, they can participate, they can cooperate, they can give feedback, vote on ideas that somebody had. Um, that's essentially the idea behind it. Um, a slight shift in, in, in the theme because I thought this might also be interesting since most likely there are LSPs on, on, on the webinar as well uh, listening. Um, so I was thinking, I always get asked what can you actually, what part of terminology work can you actually outsource to a language service providers? Um, and I think there are some things that can very well be outsourced to language service providers and probably some other things which are not so easy. Um, so I think everybody, everything that has to do with really thorough and really brand new, because terminology, if it's a good process, deals with brand new things that haven't been translated yet because they just got invented or are in the process of being invented, <clears throat> it's going to be really hard to outsource subject matter knowledge. Um, and it's, I think, also going to be really hard to outsource um, the decision um, on, if you have synonyms, for instance, which one should be the preferred term for the company. Of course, you could think about outsourcing these things if you have a partner who's been on board for a very long time and it's basically just an extension of the company. Um, but I do believe more strongly that this is something that has to be done inside the client uh, organization itself. What you can outsource to an LSP is, of course, the, the other languages. Yeah? So if you have, I don't know, 30 new concepts, what are we going to call this in all our different target languages? Uh, you can outsource the coordination of the reviewers. Yeah? So try to make the translators talk to the reviewers, coordinate the process of approving um, these suggestions. And I personally think, and we actually do this uh, with quite a few customers, um, you could also outsource the role of the moderator of the, let's say, terminologist um, to the LSP. So the person that receives um, requests that basically does the first check, is this worth putting in the term base or is this something we already have in the term base but it's just a synonym for it delegating it to the correct people to fill in the gaps, um, sending it out into approval. So those kind of things can actually be done by an LSP as well, um, I think. So there could be a scenario um, where you would have an LSP basically being at the hub, managing and moderating the process. Um, you could have subject matter experts inside the client organization somehow accessing this system. Now you could have your translators somewhere spread across the world, most likely. Um, and the in-country reviewers as well, um, but they all contribute to the system. So that would be one um, possible scenario of how to do this if you are actually an LSP. Um, so in concluding, and I'm pretty much on time actually, I think we started five minutes late, so I'm just perfect with my 30 minutes that I had planned. Um, so I think in, in uh, conclusion, uh, if you do want to also increase your return on investment and just making it more simple and making it really this four-hour uh, work week, technology work week kind of approach. Um, I think that collaboration is something uh, to seriously look at. Um, yeah, it's also called like crowdsourcing in some other context. Um, I t t tend to rather call it collaboration than crowdsourcing because it's not really a crowd. I mean, it's a controlled crowd, so to speak. Um, I think that can significantly boost the effectiveness and the efficiency also of terminology management. So try to get people to collaborate um, by making it interesting by making it a little bit fun. Um, and you can make it interesting by, uh, as I suggested, give some additional information, make it really simple to them so they don't have to read through a complicated database structure to understand what this whole thing is about. Um, and I think it would be a very interesting, maybe also a source of business revenue even, um, for LSPs to move into that direction and actually moderate this process because 
project managers of LSPs are really at the hub between authors, subject matter experts, translators, reviewers. We have to do with all these different kind of people. Um, so I think it's a perfect position actually to be moderating the terminology um, process. So it brings me to the end of my presentation. So what I would like to do is um, show you a little bit um, of how we implemented these ideas in the solution that we call um, Quick Term. Um, it's actually also known as SDL multi-term workflow. Um, that's because if SDL resells our solution, they have basically changed the label to make it fit their kind of naming convention. Um, but it's really the same thing. The only difference is uh, it's green if it's uh, through SDL and it's orange uh, if it's through Kaleidoscope. But apart from that, it's really the same thing. So let me switch over to my server. I'm going to be a little bit challenged when I type because uh, my kids stole my keyboard um, and I'm in the home office today since it's already uh, almost 6 o'clock here in Austria. Um, and I'm with an Apple keyboard, so I'm going to type on an Apple keyboard connected to a Windows server. So that's an interesting constellation right there. Um, one of the uh, big issues that we have um, with, with our QuickTime solution um, is that we want the terminology to be um, accessible very easily. So what we try to avoid is we try to avoid complicated logins and things like that. So uh -huh, okay, it looks like my server went to sleep while I was talking. So. Let's give it a little while to wake up first. Um, so essentially, uh, if you log in uh, to the term base, and of course it's German because it's a German server, so I'll change it to English, sorry about that. Um, so if you log into the term base, you're not actually asked who you are. Of course, in a corporate environment, that can be an issue, and we can, of course, disable that feature. Um, but I think this already reduces uh, the threshold of people logging into the system because they don't have to re remember a username. Uh, and when you come to the system, uh, you will notice that it doesn't really look like a database immediately. Yeah, it looks more like a, a like a website actually. So we welcome them with with some text, which is totally customizable, of course. Um, you could also welcome them directly with your terms of the week. That's what a lot of our clients actually do. They don't have this uh, welcome text or so, um, but they actually have the term of the week out there. So you could have something like this, and this is just silly demo data. Yeah, so um, don't seriously read it. It's just supposed to be a little bit funny, maybe. Um, change this to English as well. <clears throat> or you could go straight to the term quiz. Yeah? So you could say, okay, well, the term quiz is actually what um, I want to welcome my users with. So the term quiz kind of works like the quiz shows on TV. Yeah? So you have uh, questions that are completely freely customizable by, of course, your terminology team. Um, and then you have potential answers. So you can say, well, I think this is called rapid dial. And when you click on it, it'll tell you, no, that was not correct. Uh, you can provide a reason, hopefully a little bit more uh, logical reason than this one, uh, and then you essentially go on to the next question. So that's kind of the way these term quizzes work, and um, you can build on that, you can have scores, you can potentially track uh, the success. We're very careful with that because in the German-speaking countries, data protection is a very sensitive issue. Um, so by default, for instance, we don't log the results of each user because you know then the trade unions would come in and say, no, 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 wait a second, this is critical because Next time this person uh, has a discussion with his manager, the manager could tell them, well, you didn't know uh, eight answers on the last term quiz, so I'm going to reduce your salary. Uh, but you could do these kind of things if you want to really build a community. Um, and if you get to the more really like down-to-earth term-based kind of features, we've tried to add things that we learned from like the social web applications. Uh, so for instance, we, we can actually like entries. So if you stumble across an entry and say, oh, that's really useful, I want to let my colleagues know about this, you can just like it yeah, over here, um, and then it will be added to this list of liked entries. Um, or as a terminologist, uh, you can recommend entries, so you can tell your people, I think this triangle of reference is really important, everybody should look at that. Um, of course, what you can also do is you can simply search, yeah? so if I search, for instance, for the triangle of meaning, um, I search for this, then I get a hit, um, and this is where simplicity comes into play, we try to make it really simple. So we try to go away from the way, uh, that, that was good, uh, we try to get away from the way that uh, normal uh, terminology databases present data, um, which can be quite confusing to somebody who's not constantly using it. So uh, we actually turn this around uh, and have the term uh, in the beginning of the entry, which of course is against all um, academic ideas of terminology management, but it's still a concept-oriented database. Um, as a matter of fact, I should I should mention this, that um, our solution sits on top of other term-based term solutions. 
Uh, so in my implementation here, I have uh, STL multi-term server behind it. So this data actually comes directly from the multi-term server. Um, it could also sit on top of Acrolinks, for instance, um, but the majority of our, our projects are sitting on top of STL multi-term server. And the advantage of that, and we designed it uh, intentionally like that, is we did not want to be yet another term-based solution or yet another database, and then you have to somehow synchronize with you know your translation management and your authoring checker and things like that. <clears throat> so we said, we're not going to develop a new terminology system in itself. We're going to develop uh, a collaborative workflow system based on top of an existing um, term base. So that's exactly um, what this is. So this really is a multi-term entry um, behind the scenes, so to speak. But we tried to present it more clearly. So for instance, we tried to make it really clear that triangle of meaning is actually not uh, what you're supposed to use. Yeah, so this little icon here, of course, you have to explain that to your users. but I think it's fairly self-explanatory that this is okay, this is kind of okay, uh, and this is not okay at all. Of course, you could add data to it that makes it more obvious why one thing is uh, allowed and the other one isn't, but I'm always a fan of keeping it really simple and not adding um, too much information here. Um, so I have searched for the triangle of meaning. I actually found the triangle of meaning. It's 100% match to what I have searched. But what we actually see is, OK, it's actually called triangle of reference. And then we can read the definition if we want to. Uh, we can look at this image if we want to actually read uh, what this says. We can print it. We can look at the workflow status, et cetera. So of course, you can search. That would be really boring in a term base if you couldn't search. Uh, you can go, also go on and search in, in other sources if you want to. So if you're in a company, for instance, you could have, I don't know, your SharePoint index, document index on here or um, whatever other sources you want to search. <clears throat> we also have a different way of searching in the term base because sometimes you're looking for something. Um, this is particularly true if you're not a translator because then, of course, you always have the source term. Um, but rather, if you're like an author or, I don't know, you're a, a computer developer and you want to figure out what was the name of that button, how did we label it, and you just don't know what you search for. Uh, so then what we did is uh, we actually um, built like this like a sort of like a navigation tool through the term base, so you can say, well, I'm ac obviously actually looking for a kind of product. Um, I'm actually looking for a fastening product, not a shelf and not a door hinge. Uh, and I'm actually looking for a kind of bolt. So if you go in here, then I will get all the bolts. Granted, it's a very small term base, just like 10 entries or so. Um, but essentially, you will get all the hits that have something to do with, um, with bolts. And then maybe the eye bolt uh, was exactly the thing I was looking for. Yeah, it looks like this, perfect. Um, by the way, it's not the same as a ring bolt. So for everybody who thought that um, this was the same as a ring bolt, it's actually not. This is a ring bolt. So you'll learn something about these bolts as well. Um, and then, of course, it goes a little bit into the collaboration. So for instance, if I'm a very um, keen observer, I will notice that how come there's absolutely no definition here? Or <clears throat> the Germans actually are not sure whether this is the allowed term or not. So this is a rather basic entry. So I could send feedback to the terminology team. Um, I could say, you know what, there's actually, maybe it's about the ring bolt, uh, there is no definition here. So maybe add that. I didn't log into the system. So uh, in my demo, I have configured the system to ask at least for an email address. Um, because as a terminologist, or maybe as an LSP uh, project manager, if you get feedback from, say, a reviewer, and you don't know who it is, um, it can be hard, for instance, to ask questions about that. So. I have configured my system to actually, hmm, how do I type the at symbol on the Mac uh, keyboard? Uh, I think I don't. Yeah, right. That was not a good idea. So I'm just going to do it like this. We don't check correct emails anyhow. Um, of course, if you are logged in uh, with your username, then this question will not be asked. And the system knows who you are. Um, another thing that might happen is you're looking for something. Say you're looking for the thin slab casting plant, one of my favorites. Um, and you click search, and nothing happens because that's not in the term base. Not even anything remotely similar to that, because otherwise the fuzzy search would have found it, of course. So what I want to do here is, well, I want to request this. I'm about to write a manual on a thin slab casting plant, um, so I want to request this. Um, and for some strange reason, it didn't copy it over here. It should have copied that over here. But I can copy and paste it. Um, and depending on the configuration, I can give any amount of additional information. These are actually fields um, that are direct mirrors of the term base itself. So in the term base, there is a field called note um, and one called source. You might need to explain that to the users, what this is and what you expect in here, uh, or simply not display the fields at all. 
um, a message, a typical one is be, be quick, and then again down here I have my email address for not knowing how to um, type the at sign, I'm going to use this one. Um, so I have filed a, a term request now. Um, yeah, maybe let's leave it at that for the time being. So if I log in here now as a moderator, as a terminologist, maybe I am the LSP who's a project manager. <clears throat> and um, coming back to my four times four example, this is something that you can really do in a few minutes, filing a request. If you're a translator working in an environment, maybe in uh, Trado Studio, we even have integrations there, so you can highlight a term, right mouse click it and say please request, um, and it will be immediately locked into the system. So um, that's something that you can probably do in the times that I had in my funny math example. Um, so now if I log in as uh, a terminologist, um, I have this request management here. Actually, I have a lot more here as a terminologist because, of course, I'm a power user. Um, one thing that might be interesting to some of you are actually the statistics. <clears throat> so if you're a, a power terminologist, you might be interested in, in seeing some statistics on the term base. So it's a little bit sluggish here in my demo. So here we log. Uh, what user groups have searched, what terms, how often, how often did they find something, how often did they not find something. As a matter of fact, if they don't find something, we automatically log that. So the terminologist can always go in the, uh, into the system and say, well, which things have been searched but not found. Um, so we do these kind of things, but of course what's interesting now is uh, the request management. Um, so here I see all the requests uh, with a lot of detail about them because uh, as a terminologist, um, sometimes you have hundreds of requests in here and then you want to be able to filter them by type or by um, whatever else you want to do. So that's why we have a lot of columns in this table. Um, but one of them was our term request. Yeah? So I can see that this user called Quick Term Web, so some anonymous user, um, actually filed uh, this term request. Um, and what I could do now is I could say, well, you know what, I have no idea about thin slab casting plant. This clearly has to go to my colleague or if I'm an LSP, this clearly has to go to the client. Um, so what I can do is uh, two things. I can simply ask them a question. So I can say, depending on who I have access to, um, I can say, well, I want to add, ask this specialist a certain question. I actually want to grant him right access um, to this so that they can just freely add whatever information they want to um, to this particular term request. So that's the rather, let's say, freestyle uh, way of delegating that. I can also, on the other hand, I can be very precise and I can so I can click on here and I can say, you know what, um, from this person I want exactly this field. Yeah, I want exactly the English definition. That's what this person is supposed to do. Uh, and you assign it to somebody, send it off, uh, and then that person only has access to this very one field um, that was delegated to them. So there are different ways of basically arriving at the same thing. Of course, what I can also do is I can just do this myself. Yeah, I can just open this request. Uh, and then say, well, I know that there are other fields here in our term-based structure, so um, there could be a usage field, so I'm going to say this is standard usage. Uh, it might be regional, yeah, so maybe this is only used in the US. In the UK, it's something else or it doesn't exist. I might add my own definition, whatever. Um, and I can delegate it on from there, or I can just go right in there and say, okay, and this is perfect. This should be created in the term base immediately, or maybe merged with an existing entry, so it could be that somebody has filed a synonym, which actually should be merged with something that's already in there. So for now, I'm just going to create it so that we can go on and see what else can happen to this. Um, and then I actually created this. Um, and you can see that the state is now created. Um, you can also see that it turned green in our little preview here. Why is that? Because I set the usage to um, be standard. Um, so you can see as a terminologist, I see a little bit more of the entry um, than I did as an end user. Uh, and that's just because it's configured that way. Um, and what I could do now is I could say, okay, but this needs to go into approval still. Yeah? So while I, as a terminologist, as an LSP project manager, maybe I think this is okay the way it is, but it has to go to a certain group of people to be approved. So I would go in here and I would say, I want to assign an approval task on this. Um, and then my configuration is very rudimentary. So I don't have a lot of groups that can approve this, so I don't really need to filter them <clears throat> based on their subject area. Um, I can give them a deadline if I want to. I can write a comment. Um, and then, basically, I'm going to do this only to the approvers. Um, I can send this off, uh, and then they will get an approval task. So if the approver logs in, um, they will have the option of approving or rejecting uh, the thin slab casting plant. And of course, from there, it entirely depends on the workflow, whether 
um, it's enough for one person to say something or whether I need a majority. So this is the kind of collaboration that I have here. I have the hub, which is um, the terminologist, the terminator maybe, hopefully not, um, or the project manager at the LSP who is delegating the thing out to people. Um, and I have users that log in according to the role. And I think it's the last one I'm going to log in as because we're getting close to the end. If I log in as an approver, for instance, um, if I go to my request management now, um, I should see exactly this one entry, um, actually more, so that's from the last demo. But uh, I think FinSlab casting plan, that's the one uh, I was just delegated. So what I can do is I can approve it um, or I can reject it. That's all I can do. And of course, I can write the comment. So maybe there are colleagues who are also working on that and I can post a comment um, and then all my colleagues will see this as well. So you can actually chat um, before you reach a decision, but hopefully in the end you will just approve this. Um, and then there's an approved <coughs> entry in the term base. So if I go to FinSlab casting plan, oops, and that's because I'm looking for a German term that will not work, of course. Um, then I have an approved, actually it still has to be approved by somebody else, so uh, it's still in progress. Um, you can look at the workflow that it went through. Um, and of course the translation works the same way. So you would assign a task to a translator to please provide a translation. From there it would go to the reviewer to approve or reject it. It would go back to the translator. That's the way it works. Um, and it's always groups of people, so that's where the collaboration um, comes in and I think I'm going to leave it at that uh, so that if there were any questions, there was one. So Devin, I don't know if you want to uh, jump in somehow or if I should just take the questions. I'm trying to see if I can make this panel look bigger because I can read like one line of the question. Mm. Hi, Carl Sia, we do have a few questions, as you might see. Um, and if yeah. anyone has any additional questions, feel free to type them into the chat box now. Um, and we'll try to get to as many as we can uh, before the end of the webinar. And uh, of course, if you don't have time to have your question answered, you can always um, write us an email later, and we'll be happy to follow up. So yeah. um, Klaus, I'll so hand it back over to you. Excellent. And I managed to make my panel a little bit bigger, so I don't have to read the query line by line. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, <laughs> right, there were a few, actually you also asked a question, I don't know, if, but I'll keep your question to the end if we run out of other questions. Um, so there's, uh, there was one question whether quick term also extracts terminology. Um, no, it, it's not a terminology extraction tool. So what we didn't want to do is we didn't want to build yet another terminology solution with everything that belongs to it. Uh, we wanted to fill this one particular gap that we felt um, and we felt that this gap was in the collaboration of, let's say, teams that are, or, or team members who are not necessarily terminologists. Yeah, so this tool, of course, it does cater to the terminologist in a certain way. So we do have power tools like statistics. We add things like version control, version comparison. Um, but the main idea behind the project product is actually roll this out to a huge user base and try to make them actively um, collaborate with you. So. Terminology extraction is something that um, the tools that we sit on top of actually can do already. Um, so for all, everybody who has a multi-term uh, server, we'll have a terminology extraction tool for that. Um, so then I would say, well, use STL multi-term extract um, to extract your terminology. Everybody that implements this on top of Acrolinks has Acrolinks. Acrolinks has a terminology extraction tool in their suite of product. Use that. You know, so, so that's not our focus. We think that you know we don't want to compete with um, existing and very good tools. Um, we want to add this collaboration aspect to it. Um, I hope it makes sense. There was another side to this question, which is, uh, is it, com um, I think it's supposed to mean compatible with MemoQ. Uh, so no, uh, we deliberately sit on top of uh, STL Multiterm and Acrolinks, which has to do with the fact that we are uh, technology partners um, with them. Um, with MemoQ or Kilgrey, we're not a technology partner. Um, so we wouldn't want to develop that functionality at that point. But that's a strategic decision that we took, essentially. Um, there's another very short uh, question, which I uh, would rather take offline. So there's a question of uh, what the price for this product is. Um, that's a little bit difficult. I mean, the, the plain answer that I like to give is uh, the price is, of course, very low compared to the benefit. Um, but I'd rather not give a price for a solution uh, in an online webinar. I'd rather get in touch directly. So if you're interested, 
send send me an email and I will find out first of all who is uh, responsible for that geographic region of the world um, region of the world and um, then we can give a precise quotes based on the parameters that we need to know before um, we give a price for it uh, and then there's a rather lengthy question by Alan Milby hi Alan um, which a rather technical question um, about how we actually connect to the term bases that uh, we sit on top of. Um, so no, we have not used uh, a dialect of any existing standard uh, like TBX uh, to connect with it, but we connect a lot more directly. Uh, we connect via the API. Uh, so API, I don't know, there might be non-techy people on the webinar as well. Uh, API stands for application programming interface um, so that essentially is a hook that software developers can use um, to get directly inside the other product uh, so essentially our QuickTerm server will connect directly to the multi-term server just like a multi-term client would do yeah, so we directly connect um, to the server um, which is a lot faster than exchanging data and having to export import and transform the data into TBX and, and read it to us <coughs> so would have been an option to uh, to bank on TBX. Um, might have been a, an option to be a little bit more compatible. Um, but then the question is, you know, how much can you really use TBX exports? Um, because you typically need to map them to existing term-based structures. So that gets a little bit messy. And of course, the other disadvantage is it, it's not really real time. And API access is always real time. Um, you know, we, um, so what we don't do, for instance, is um, if you have other people working directly on a multi-term database, um, then we don't get into the way of these by using an API uh, approach. So if, I, if somebody edits a term using multi-term or using Studio or using just whatever other tool um, can connect to the multi-term server, this is immediately reflected in QuickTerm just because we're con connected directly to the server um, through the API. So that was a very technical answer, sorry, but it was also a very technical question. Hope it answered the question. Um, these were the questions that the audience asked. Devin also asked an interesting question. I don't know if I should uh, go into that. So uh, your question was if uh, there are actually LSPs that um, offer this kind of service that um, I discussed or um, this idea of, you know, as an LSP acting as a moderator in the terminology process. Um, so, so the clear answer is uh, obviously yes. Um, Actually, our sister company, which is Eurocom Translation Services, we do that uh, a lot ourselves. Um, obviously, that's where a lot of the ideas also come from. Um, so that's a very practical synergy that we also have uh, a language service provider company that basically sits right next to the technology company um, because we get very good ideas and direct input from uh, them. And they're our best beta testers, of course. Um, and there we use that quite intensely. and it's. Uh, been very uh, beneficial because uh, the, the client LSP relation just improves a lot because you can work on this together. We're not the only ones. We do also have other LSPs that uh, do this. Um, it's also one way of actually giving your client access to your term base. Yeah, so you could essentially sort of host uh, the term base for your client and giving them very, very targeted uh, access that can be be restricted um, in a very granular manner. So I don't know if you're familiar with the um, multi-term server way of giving access to certain entries or certain terms or maybe even only certain languages. Um, that's a little bit rigid, uh, the filtering mechanism there, so we have a lot more granular filters. So you could give your client access, for instance, only to five languages, um, but not to all 15. Um, or you could give them within one entry <coughs> access only, let's say, to the approved terms, but, but not the other ones. I would not encourage that. Um, I believe very strongly that all the non-approved terms and the forbidden terms should always also be in the term base because otherwise you can't find them. Um, but that's something you could technologically do. So I hope that um, answers that question. And I don't know if there are any other ones. I don't know. Maybe are, am I missing any? I can see three. I don't know if you see more than three. Um, I think those were all the questions we had. Um, and of course, if anyone has any other questions that they didn't get to uh, now, or if you think of something later on, just please feel yeah. free to email us and uh, or email Klaus, and we'll be happy to follow up. Um, so yeah, thanks for those great questions. Um, yeah, one one last remark you. that 
I do have that mm -hmm. on the slide as well. So we, we have um, our solution actually sitting in the internet. So if you go to this URL that I have down here on the slide, um, you will actually be able to log on to our, our uh, let's say, public testing server. Um, okay. If you find any data on, the, on there that you don't agree with, then uh, don't blame us because it's a public server. So <laughs> people can create whatever they want to on there, but um, we clean it up every now and then. <laughs> Oh, all right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you also for the opportunity to speak here. It was it was fun. Yeah, and thank you again for joining us, Klaus. Uh, we that was a really great presentation, and um, a big thank you to all of the participants for joining us today. We really appreciate it, um, and we'd also really appreciate it if you could just take a moment to give us your feedback on today's session using the post-event survey. Uh, you will also be able to enter any unanswered questions in there if you have any. Um, your feedback helps us to constantly refine our webinar program. And we certainly hope you'll join us next week for a webinar on decoding cultural differences during an international rollout from Melanie Scherer of ZS uh, Friedrich Schaffen. And with that, I will wish you a good day or a good night, depending on where you are, and look forward to seeing you at another Gala webinar soon. Thank you. Thank you as well. <laughs>